And then after all of the presenters, we'll have um, a Q&A session at the end. So if you can just, uh, for those of you that are live streaming, just keep sending them in. We'll make a note of them. For those of you in the room, just jot down your questions and we'll take all of those at the end. Um, each of them, each of the presenters will share a 15 minute kind of overview of their AICP experience. These presentations, I will also be emailing out to you so that you have their contact information and you can harass them till your heart's content. Okay, so first let's introduce Jaina, come on up. <laughs> I won. <laughs> she just said that she feels like she's on prices right. Let's make a note of that, please. Noted. Um, I also have never been a YouTuber, so this is exciting. Um, a lot of us have been very educationally fueled lately, and it's hello. My name is Stephanie Cervantes. As you can see, I am an I AICP candidate. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself, and then I'll go into what the program is and to study tips as well. Hello. Uh, my name is Ricky Williams. Um, despite my stature, I am not the famous football player. Uh, I am an environmental and transportation uh, planner at Ascent Environmental. Um, I have a focus on just environmental transportation planning and climate action planning. Uh, and I have been an AICP, AICPer uh, since November of 2017. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, hello again. Um, my name is Nate. Uh, I have a question regarding um, uh, the practicing uh, in terms of meeting with friends and groups. I think all of you at least mentioned once that that was a good technique. Um, were you part of a listserv or a headquarters or some kind so that people could message each other to meet up together? Or is that just some organic, you know, creation? So the first time that I was taking the exam, um, I just went on a Facebook group for Orange County planners that I was involved in and I was like, hey, I'm going to take the exam. Anybody else going to take it? Let's st do a study group. If you fail, do you have to reapply? No. So actually, I'll take this one. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> Fairly familiar with having this conversation with folks. Um, no, you don't. You actually um, can take the exam three times before you are then forced to reapply. And if you start to look at the street layouts, right, we're not on a grid anymore. Old cities are on grids. And our grid initially in our major uh, metropolitan areas were tight gridiron plans, right? As we go out into our first ring suburban areas off of streetcar lines, we see rectilinear blocks. They're still a little pedestrian oriented, but that block distance grows. By the time we get into the 20s and 30s into these garden city suburban layouts, you see our street form has changed radically, okay? We are no longer accessible off of um, streetcars or trolleys, and we are becoming reliant on the automobile. And this is also the time when the automobile is rising in popularity from the 1920s forward. Okay, so typical street form here. This could be a suburban development from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and I guess even 80s. Um, it really sets the model. So we tend to think that the suburbs occurred in this country in the post-World War II period, but in fact, they have roots all the way back to Ebenezer Howard at the turn of the century and into the 1920s with Garden Cities and into the 1930s with the United States uh, Resettlement Administration Greenbelt Towns. Development regulations, that's your setbacks, and if you have design guidelines, things like that. Um, and you'll probably get plenty of, if you haven't had law yet, the exactions and mitigation stuff in another session. Certainly be familiar with it because it's, it's a lot of case law is built in that area, and it's certainly important with respect to um, how planning gets done. So just throw another question there. Um, which of the following offers development options in a, geogra in a different geographical area? Transfer development rights. We don't do much of that. It used to be a little more common. Uh, there's if you're the if you're the only property owner, then it's a little easier just to say, well, I want to build in this corner and not build in this corner because you own all the property and you can just do a specific plan or a map that allows you to do that. 
some of the transfer of development rights, though, are really through two private parties uh, working with the, the lead agency to, to move development around to where it makes more sense. So starting with rights and regulations, there are three things we're going to cover. Property rights, city's police powers, and constitutional limitations. So when it comes to individuals' property rights, there are many different ways to try to describe exactly what they are. And the most popular metaphor is a bundle of sticks, because there's not just one in particular property right. There are a number of things that you can do with your property. You can possess it, use it, manage it, derive income from it, consume it, you can destroy it, you can modify it, you can alienate, which means to sell, uh, or you can, in some cases, possibly exclude people from your property. Property rights are a very important part of uh, constitutional law because cities' police powers bump up against individuals' property rights. So a couple of cases here. First is Hadachek v. Sebastian from 1915. And so there was uh, a problem in Los Angeles where there was a brick-making factory in a residential neighborhood. So the city adopted an ordinance that said, no more brick factories in residential neighborhoods. Well, Mr. Hadachak owned one of these brick factories, and the ordinance greatly diminished the value of his property. But he continued making bricks anyway. And so then he was arrested by the police chief, Sebastian, and it went up to the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Hadachak was arguing that this regulation had pretty much taken his property since he could no longer use it. What the Supreme Court said was that the city's ordinance was a valid exercise of its police powers to pre uh, protect against harm to public health because people were getting sick from the, from the brick making. And this type of use segregation leads us into the case of uh, Village of Euclid, uh, the Amber, Amber Realty, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. Uh, it's, one, it's the seminal case. Which, uh, which provided for uh, a constitutional uh, explanation of zoning. So the key thing is that the APA, AICP uh, code is really divided into four areas. One is principles which we aspire to, uh, rules of conduct, procedural provisions for charge of misconduct uh, investigation, Procedures for governance of planners uh, convicted of a serious crime. I have a story about that, too. But ultimately, it's understanding these four areas is a, a critical piece. <clears throat> One of the other things I always like to focus on is the, you know, the history of the AICP ethics. You know, in 78, uh, planners' responsibility to the public. It's 78 where we start saying we should come up with the overall program of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. <clears throat> we're starting to see the evolution. Uh, planner's primary obligation to serve the public interest. That's a cornerstone of everything in this overall ethical pro program. And a planner must strive to expand choice and opportunity to all persons. So those become key elements of the overall aspect. I have an image on the right-hand side of the slide of The Power Broker. Does anybody know the book, The Power Broker? And, uh, you know, it's a story of Robert Moses. <clears throat> and Robert Moses has been <clears throat> somewhat vilified the last 20 years. At the same time, he actually accomplished a lot, and so we forget the good and the bad, <clears throat> and largely was perceived, particularly um, uh, in the Brooklyn area, not, not, uh, not just Brooklyn, but actually down the village, as <clears throat> somebody that was uh, an autocrat and basically making decisions without the advantage of uh, the input of the community and things like that. So a little bit about me, because um, I think it's always good for you to know where I'm coming from in my perspective. Um, my master's is in geography from SDSU, and I started out in consulting as a planner, both uh, urban, environmental planning, and CEQA work. And most of my projects were for public agencies, and I really enjoyed the, the public involvement piece. And through the years, I had colleagues who would ask me to help them with their projects on the public participation piece. The conversation kind of went like this. You seem to really like public involvement and being involved in workshops. Most of us don't, so can you just come and help us with that part? And um, <laughs> yeah, you're laughing because you all know there's a little truth in that. And so... Um, 
and that then evolved to taking a position um, with AECOM where I was, my charge was to build up a public participation group. And so that was probably about um, 15 years ago where I really started focusing more on public participation. And so now in the work that I do, um, I am a principal at Crimson West, and we are from the only focuses on public involvement, stakeholder facilitation, and strategic communications. We're What I'm going to do today is, is share with you the demographic analysis and transportation and long range planning uh, as this module. So, um, as Lorena mentioned, we, we'll get into some statistics. We're not going to do a, really much math. I think in, in person we would do some whiteboard exercises, but I just want to bring some concepts, concepts up that you can do uh, some research on, like do some, some kind of math problems on your own. And um, I'm guessing several of you have done some quantitative methods courses. So, um, one thing I would recommend is going back through some of the, the basic overviews of, of, of in that w things that were shared in those, that co coursework and reach out to me if you feel like you're light on anything and I can give you some, you know, places to look for some of the detailed math or, you know, quantitative methods pieces. So, um, you know, with that, we're going to go over these, uh, these topics today. Um, and I have about, um, I think it's about a hundred slides. So I, my pacing is probably going to be about a minute of slides. So we'll kind of go through these pretty quickly, but I'll be watching, um, the sort of chat box here and, and definitely Lorena and Greg interrupt if I'm, if people are trying to ask questions or, you know, add to it. And please definitely interrupt me to add to things too. I think being a small group, um, we can kind of make this as like a small, uh, you know, classroom. All right, so let's talk a little bit about leadership, administration, and management. And I'm going to try to take my uh, personal experiences, professional experiences from the last 20 years of being in the public sector um, and share those with you in terms of examples. Obviously, I'll be touching on Green Book, technical issues that you might want to dive into a little bit further uh, on your own during your study sessions. But mostly, I'll just try to make this relatable um, as much as possible. So to tell you a little bit about me, uh, as I mentioned, I have 20 years in public sector planning. I actually started uh, about a, a year before that in, in a nonprofit public housing sector uh, or affordable housing sector in uh, the Detroit area. So that was very interesting. Um, I've worked, I've had the opportunity to work in advanced planning, uh, on general plans and variety of other projects, current planning, um, environmental planning. I've gotten to work to some degree, both sides of the counter, even within the public um, context, by working for a department that uh, built capital projects. So I had the opportunity to work for our general services department at the County of San Diego, um, which was very enlightening to get to be, <clears throat> pardon me, a project manager who's really focused on budget, schedule, and other project components um, that, as a planner, are not always at the forefront of our mind as we think about uh, other really important values like community character, uh, legal compliance, regulatory compliance, and uh, community values. Mm -hmm. 